Hello and welcome to episode number 551 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell and this week I have an interesting conversation for you. I mean, I try to do that every week, but I'm very excited about this episode. Back in December, I connected with author Helena Greer, who wrote Season of Love, which you might have heard me talk about. I also connected with Sam Brody, who's the acquiring editor at Hachette, who worked on the book with Helena. And so we talk about the behind the scenes details of writing and editing, why Sam acquired this book, what it meant to her, and what the experience was like bringing this book into market. There are a few audio skips or what I think of as sound bubbles, like there's just a little bubble in the audio. And my apologies for that. I did my best to correct them. We talk about a lot of books in this episode, and you know they will be in the show notes at smartpitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast. I have a compliment this week. This makes me so happy. To Rebecca T., you may not have thought that the effort you made was noticed or appreciated, but there are currently seven different people who are now convinced that you have made the world much, much better. Thank you. If you have supported the show with a monthly pledge of any amount, thank you, thank you. You're helping me make sure that each episode has a transcript. Hi, Garlic Knitter. And you keep the show going every week. And if you join our Patreon at patreon.com slash smartbitches, you get bonus episodes, a very lovely Discord, and you get lots and lots of bad jokes in the joke channel. It's like a sneak preview of terrible humor. I also want to say hello to Teresa, who joined the Patreon this week. Hello, Teresa. Thank you for joining us. This episode is brought to you this week by Ball and Branch. Now, as you know, I love sleeping. I love being in bed. I love being all warm and cozy. And I am very attentive to my sleep. And I just want to tell you that I am extra, extra cozy with my sheets from Ball and Branch. They're made with 100% organic cotton and they get softer every time I wash them. And the quality is noticeable even in the seams, which is not a thing I have ever paid much attention to. Ball and Branch sheets come in gorgeous colors. They look beautiful. I went with a deep blue gray called Mineral and it matches everything in my bedroom perfectly. And this is my favorite part. The sheets have really deep pockets for the mattress and the top sheet is labeled with top and bottom tags. I I can't tell you how life-changing this was for me. It made the making the bed so fast. Ball and Branch sheets help me sleep better. They are incredibly soft. They're like a hug when I make my nightly covers cocoon. And best of all, Ball and Branch gives you a 30-night risk-free guarantee with free shipping and returns on all U.S. orders. You can make the most of bedtime with Ball and Branch sheets. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code Sarah at ballandbranch.com. That's Ball and Branch, B-O-L-L, A-N-D-B-R-A-N-C-H dot com. Promo code Sarah. This episode is brought to you in part by Headspace. I know you have probably heard as many times as I have about the power of meditation to improve mental health and well being. But like me, if you've ever tried to build a habit of meditation, it can be really hard. If you found it difficult, try Headspace. Headspace helps improve mental health through guided meditations, mindfulness practices, breathing and calming exercises, and so much more. These tools can help reduce anxiety, boost your mood, and help you sleep better. I love the daily meditations, but focus is my favorite section of Headspace. There are playlists that are about 45 minutes to an hour of music to listen to that, well, helps me focus. And if you like having background music that's rich and interesting, but not distracting and has no lyrics, which is a big plus for me, you will love these. My favorite playlist is the Arcade Fire one. I've probably listened to it 20 times. It never gets boring. Headspace has helped me and more than 100 million people worldwide, and they can help you too. Listen up, because you do not want to miss this. I have arranged something special for a limited time. All of you can try Headspace free for 30 days by going to headspace.com slash Sarah 30. You will not find this offer anywhere else. But you must use my link, headspace, H-E-A-D-S-P-A-C-E dot com slash Sarah 30 to unlock all of Headspace free for 30 days. This is not something they'd normally do. Headspace dot com slash Sarah 30. All right. Are you ready for a funky conversation about seasons of love with Helena Greer and Sam Brody? Let's do this on with the podcast. Hi, I'm Sam Brody. I am an assistant editor at Forever, which is an imprint of Grand Central Publishing at Hachette, where we publish romance and relationship-focused fiction. And I realize I should put my phone on mute. No, that's fine. I never remember to do that, so don't even worry about <laughs> it. 
I'm Helena Greer, and I am a debut romance novelist. My first novel, Season of Love, is out now. I am also a librarian and sex educator. Well, that's cool. Congratulations on the publication of Season of Love. I have to tell you. All right. I always do this. My listeners are going to be so tired of this. I owe you guys an apology because I inhaled this book in one day. So you did all of this work and all of this writing. And I was just like unhinging my jaw and just being like putting it down into my mental gullet. It was so freaking adorable. Easily one of the best books I have read this year. And I read a lot of books. Thank you so much for this book. I have sent it to friends. I have gifted it to people. I am like bothering everyone I know. Like, have you read this yet? You should read it. Have you read it? I send quotes to people and they're like, oh my God, would you stop? And I'm like, no, no, I won't. Sarah, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, Smart Bitches is the reason that I'm a romance writer. Get out of town. Really? Yeah. I'm going to turn purple. Watch. Bachelor's in creative writing, but I was a poet. And then I went to graduate school for librarianship. And when I was in grad school, a friend said, you should really read this website. I think you'd really enjoy it. And I had never read any romance. And I went to read the smart bitches comments. And someone said, I'm Kashiel's bitch. And I said, (laughs) I have to know what that means. I'm sorry. You're you're who, what now? (laughs) So I read, I started reading romance and during grad school, I read probably two romance novels a day trying to get through library school. Yeah. And story checks in the out. Past, and I quit writing completely after grad school because I was doing, building a career and doing all of that stuff, but I was still reading thousands and thousands and thousands of romance novels. Um, and if it hadn't been for the smart bitches readers and you pointing me to the right romance novels so I could have an entry point into feminist smart romance, um, I would never have learned to read romance. And then I would never have gone from poetry to writing romance. Holy cow. So, that is amazing. Thank you. Oh, my God. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to like get all like weepy now. It's very full circle. It is very full circle. OK, so I have the most evil question. I'm going to ask each of you, I'm going to ask each of you to describe this book. Would you like to go first or would you like me to go who's, first? Yeah, who's going first? <laughs> I know there's like overlap in our descriptions or how we will describe it. I can, I can go first. If you okay. And I can, I, I won't take the part of the description that I know you use. Um, it is a Jewish queer holiday rom-com that is Grumpy sunshine, enemies to lovers, between a chaotic bisexual disaster and the hot butch of your dreams. The hot butch of your dreams. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I would say that in the in a competition that I have just started, you are now one point ahead. Helena, can you describe your own book? <laughs> Which is like the worst thing. Go. You can do it. I have been a librarian for 15 years, so I'm supposed to be good at, professionally good at selling people books. He's enough love is a campy but also angsty glittery rage-filled millennial rom-com about two people who meet cute at a funeral and um bond over art and fall in love over their grief and share trauma but it's really funny and it is like hallmark if hallmark were gay and had more pop culture references in it. Oh, um, very true. Well yes. played. Well played. Now, I know from um, my email from Estelle, Sam, this is your first acquisition at Forever. It okay. Was. First of all, congratulations. That's really exciting when you make your first acquisition. Like, that's a big deal. Thank you. It was. I Yeah, this was like the perfect book to acquire first. So yeah. tell me about acquiring it. And what were some of your thoughts when you read the manuscript? So I took notes before this because I'm me. Um, so Helena's agent had actually sent Season of Love to my boss, Amy, who's the editor-in-chief at Forever. Um, and I may or may not have been like complaining to Amy at that point <laughs> for a while that I wanted to see more Jewish holiday romances. Oh, you and me that. both. Right? I was like, I don't know any. I mean, like, there. I mean... I knew like indie ones, but like I didn't know any of the like the big five. I was like, I want to see some 
so when she and I really wanted to see more queer romances so when she got this and she was like so I think this is up your alley do you want to read it so she put it under a box with a little stick on top and like was like Sam I built you a trap (laughs) basically yes and I was like yes I want this I mean I basically was in love from the first page I had just the year before I lost both my grandparents so I had a been sitting a lot of shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that is never fun. Thank you. It yeah. It was. It's a lot of kugel. It, was, it so much kugel. So, so much shit. So many hard boiled eggs. Oh my god. Yeah. I remember just like opening it, and it punched me in the gut in that like really good. I feel seen kind of way. Yes. Uh, honestly, like that was just really what I thought. Like when I kept reading, it was just like, oh. Like, yes, this, this is what I've been wanting to read. Like this, this feels like a conversation, like conversations I have with my friends. This feels like my queer community. This feels like my Jewish community. Like this is it. Yep. And I honestly, I couldn't stop laughing. And like 10 reads down the line, still keep laughing at the same lines, which I feel like is a very good sign. Absolutely. Because when you acquire and edit and write a book, you read it like, what, 90, 40 billion times? You read it a lot. And true confession, I may be listening to the audiobook right now. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> it's very good. It really is. Helena, how long were you writing this book? And do you remember what led you to writing this particular story? Like, where did you start? Was it the characters or was it a scene? Like, what led you into this particular? Because there's a lot going on in this world. There's a lot. There's a whole lot lot going on. A whole lot. Uh, The way that this started is that I was watching Hallmark movies uh, the day before the 2018 midterms. Ooh. Good. Um, November 5th. Good call. Good call. 2018. Yeah. Good call. And um, I started tweeting. (laughs) Rage tweeting. Okay, Lifetime, here's a free story idea for you. And I tweeted this series of, like, you know, girl inherits a tree farm. It wasn't exactly the, the, the plot of Season of Love, but it was fairly similar. Um, and a friend of mine, a queer Jewish friend of mine, uh, DM'd me and said, Helena, you're a writer, why don't you write this? I regret Instead to inform you that you have to write this now. Yeah. <laughs> just tweeting it. Um, but I hadn't written anything in 12 years since I had left, um, I had left my bachelor's program. And it's really annoying that tweeting doesn't count as writing. It is. Annoying. I count it. I've I definitely written count it. Th- uh, Sam counts several it. novels. You've heard it. An official <laughs> editor at an actual publishing house has said that Twitter, Twitter, Twitter is writing everyone. I mean, it's going to hell you right now, what? but it's now official. It's writing. <laughs> Not to deviate, but I desperately want a novel, a romance novel that's entirely like epistolary social media. So oh. I definitely count it. <laughs> so my friend said, start the Google Doc and share it with me. Good friend. And I did. And by the end of Christmas break, I had the 40,000 word first draft. Nice. It just sort of happened. Um, And a lot of the stuff that's there, I mean, it's been rewritten several times, uh, but a lot of the stuff that was in that early draft is still there. Um, And I wanted something that felt like the beats of a Hallmark movie, right? Where um, Miriam has like an icy blonde fiance who's wrong for her. And then she goes to the hometown she hasn't been to in 10 years. And then she um, has to save the business with like a big party. And the hometown Um, is Christmas town. Yeah. And her hometown is like weirdly obsessed with Christmas. Christmas town. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Christmas town. Yeah. Um, As I started writing into those beats, they opened out because a, a Hallmark movie, you can gloss over the why of all of those things because we all have a shared vocabulary yes. in Hallmark movies. Yes. And absolutely. so like, why has this person not been to their hometown that they love for 10 years? That's a weird thing to do. Like what's the, what's the why behind that? And um, what would happen to your relationships with your loved ones if you didn't come home for 10 years and how that affect them? And why is this 
she was shown Christmas tree farm. So into Christmas, you know, my agent says that my brand is angsty queer millennials um, obsessing about home. That's Story right. checks out. Yeah, it's that tracks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you ask like sort of like, what's the I think I, I because I had never written a novel before. I was sort of like, let's put these parts in that I love in a blender. Right. So there's like some Dawson's Creek references and like the sort of vibe of Armistead Mopan's Tales of the City, if it were on a Christmas tree farm. <laughs> and like, um, it's like, what are some things that I am personally influenced by? Let's put them into a blender and come up with like a peppermint mocha. I really, I didn't ever think anything would come of it. You know, I sort of said, I'm going to share this with a friend and the friend is a published author. And she was like, I think you should query this. And then, you know, at every step I was sort of like, nobody's going to ever read this book. So I'm just going to put everything I love in it and see what happens. Um, Now it's on Barnes and Noble shelves all over the country. So clearly it worked out. It worked. That's what worked so well with it, though. Like, it it felt really so, like, fresh and new. And I, I will say this again and again. It, it feels so, incre- I feel so incredibly seen reading it. Yes. Like, you have such a great way of understanding the angsty queer millennial voice. Well, that was actually my next question for you, Sam. How exactly did this book make you feel seen? My experience reading this was the constant, quiet determination of all of the characters who are Jewish to keep on being Jewish in the midst of what my in-laws would call Ungi Potchkit Christmas. Like, it's not just Christmas. It is Christmas with a fire hose and everything is hosed down. It's like the most Christmas that has ever Christmas. And they're like, yep, still Jewish gonna go do some Jewishy things. Watch me eat some rugula. Like the continued determination to just keep on going utterly surrounded by Christmas in the story of the book was the perfect thing for me to read right now because literally I can buy Jesus at Costco right now. There's two options, actually, this year. There are two different nativity seasons or nativity sets inside the Costco, but I can buy Jesus at Costco, and I'm not even joking. So the idea that there are these characters who are just very quietly, determinedly, happily Jewish in the midst of great ye olde Christmas hoedown was like this microcosm in the book of how I feel right now at this time of year. That part meant so much to me. And I sent it to so many people for that reason. But I'm curious, Sam, what was it about it that made you feel very personally recognized? Because it's it's good to know that I'm not the only one who had that experience. I mean, that definitely was part of it. Like I, I had a conversation, I think like 10 years ago with like a younger Jewish friend of mine who was like starting college and like she had grown up in a very like insulated Jewish town. And like, so college was her first time really like experiencing the Christmas overload. Yeah. Um, And talking about like, how do you really navigate that as like someone as basically in a world where like, you can't really escape Christmas and like inevitably, like you're going to end up enjoying some part of it. Like probably like, and for me, that was like incredibly important. Like that idea of being Jewish in a world where like, you're you're not gonna I I keep saying escape and it's not like I don't mean that in like a bad way but like I work in Rockefeller Center oh yeah you got mad Christmas you got like you got like a 40 foot tree exactly like I the only possible way I could pretend it's not Christmas in December is if I literally locked the doors in my apartment (laughs) didn't turn on the tv didn't turn on like Spotify and like cut off, like cut off all electronics, barred my windows, and yeah. like moved into the middle of nowhere. Like it's you, you can't do that. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's it is omnipresent, and you don't see it until it's not yours. Yeah, so I think that was like that definitely was incredibly important to me, and also growing up. Um, so I was raised Jewish, um, and growing. Up, I think there was like a very specific image of like what you would see for Jewish people in the media. And oh, you basic, don't say. Yeah. You know what? Mm, yeah. Oh. Mm, what? Yeah. Oh. What? And it was just Holocaust books. Yeah. It's all or Holocaust books. Horrific anti Semitic stereotypes. 
Yeah. Or, or both. I mean, men. por qué no los dos? <laughs> yeah. Lots of grumpy old men. If you were lucky, there was maybe a B'nai Mitzvah book, like, book or movie, but it was always about like a bar mitzvah. And maybe there was a side plot about like a Jewish woman dealing with like beauty standards. Maybe, if you were lucky. That was never reflective of my Jewish experience or no. like being with my friends. Like I talk about like Tikkun Olam a lot with my friends and like and the importance of social justice. Like, yeah, to me, that's the conversation about Judaism that I have with like all my friends. Like, right. What it like social justice and Judaism. Yep. And like, and the how much we hate Holocaust books. Like, <laughs> that's a conversation we have all the time. <laughs> Reading something where like everyone is just Jewish and it's just part of them, but they're also, they're not like grumpy old men or they're not like people who are just like talking about the Holocaust or, which is important and like part of our history, but also is like not the only part of our history and has kind of turned into trauma porn at this juncture mm-hmm. for like most of America. Oh yes. Like it fe- I felt seen. I was like, oh, these are conversations I have with my friends. Like this is like services when I go like, this is like when I observe like Shabbos with my with like my friends and family. Like this felt like incredibly real to me. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize I was like I was bisexual until I was in my twenties, and like at that point, like seeing Jewish romance was, and I didn't start reading romance until my twenties either. Seeing Jewish romance was rare at the time. Seeing queer Jewish romance was, I mean nearly impossible yeah so i have a question for you for you both what was your reaction when you saw the cover for this book did you have to put your head between your knees because it was that great i will let helena go first (laughs) yeah so first of all i'm so grateful um to sam and amy because when i sent them the words can we do a mid-century modern thing They did not email me back and say, no, no, that doesn't look anything like any of the other books that are coming out this year. Um, Amy said, you know, I love mid-century modern illustration. Um, And I'm so grateful because I had this vision because Kerrigan's the Christmas tree farm that they all live on um, was founded in the early 60s and Cass Kerrigan, the matriarch, would have made everything this like weird atomic age, mid-century modern vibe. And, um, and the art department um, ran with that. So first of all, like that was just brilliant to me, but also um, I was like, there is a fat butch in a clinch cover grabbing a woman's ass on the cover of this Brooklyn trad club. And she's yeah. tall. She's nearly as tall as the tree. She's tall and she's fat. I did not have to go back to the art department and say, can we make her fatter? Which is so beautiful. She didn't get skinny washed or femme washed or like none of that. And um, I love all the sapphic covers that have come out this year. And I love all those books, but none of them were touching each other. So the backstory to that is I have, I was complaining about that actually when we were working on the cover for season of love. Do not and let the lesbians touch on the cover. No touchy, exactly. no touchy, no touchy, no touchy. No, right. That was a thing. I, th- I mean, it's still kind of a thing. They're just pals, people. They're, they're just, just pals. They're just and like, good so gal that was, pals. That was my one request to the art department. I was like, I want them in an explicit embrace to make it clear that they are romantic. Got her hand that on her is, ass, so it's pretty clear. Yeah. I was like, that's all. That's what I want for the cover. Like, that is my contribution for what I would like. Um, who came up with It's Time to Make the Yuletide Gay? I said something to my agent about it years ago, and, I, and then I forgot about it because I have the memory of a goldfish. Yes, you and, and me. And it appeared magically on the front of my book. And I said, maybe this is Becca's idea. I don't know. It was what it was you or Becca had said it at some point or had said it several points, like when we were talking about marketing. And at several and I kept being like, oh, that's so great. Like we have to use that somewhere. And then we were trying to think of a tagline for the front of the book. And I was like, this, 
this is where we are using this. It's time to make the Yuletide gay. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And you know me, I'm a complete sucker for a good pun. I mean, that is just that is just A plus. Absolutely glorious. So when you saw the cover, Helena, did you have to like have a seat? You never know. Like you get an email that's like, look at this cover sketch, right? And there's Oh, it's like editorial like, notes. You're like, do I even want to open this? Do I want to open this email? <laughs> don't, scare, don't say that. I, I, I'm working on editorial notes for book two now. I don't want to scare you. I'm going to open your editorial notes. Sam, Sam you must friend. know that, that an author gets an editorial note and they're like, okay, I must prepare. I must be centered. I must place myself in the good position to click open the document and go, whoa, look at all those comments. Yeah. I always have to, I always like spend the week when I'm waiting to hear back from the author being like, oh God, they hate it. They hate all my notes. Like, I'm just going to hear back that they hate everything. <laughs> So you are currently editing book two. Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. Yeah. Book two for never and always. Um, oh, good title. Yes. Thank you. That's a collaborative effort between the two of us. Very yes. good yes. for never and always. And this yeah. is um, hot, uh, uh, semi estranged, semi celebrity chef with a beard. And the woman who has been holding down the Kerrigan's operation because she told him to GTFO. Yes. It is childhood best friends, two lovers, two spoiler brackets, two explosive (laughs) breakup, estranged, haven't spoken in four years after being obsessively in love with each other their entire lives. And now he's back for Passover. Which is a long holiday if you're doing the whole thing. Yeah. Two in the front, two at the end. Oh, yeah. It's a lot. And the thing about Passover, like we traditionally host the second night, although now we just host all of them because of the pandemic. Um, The thing about Passover is that you have to make all this food and then wait because then you have to do the Seder and then you have the food. So there's lots and lots of waiting built in and expectation built in. And then the holiday is eight days. Those poor people. I will say Levi and Hannah are two people who have been like obsessed with each other their whole lives and they think about each other 24 seven. And so their love story is like a little bit more um, claustrophobic yeah. than Noel and Miriam's because Noel and Miriam are two people who their big extended found family is really important to their happiness. Right. And for them to have a happily ever after, it really had to be rooted in this like big queer found family that they had built. Right. And so there's this huge sort of like extended cast in season of love. And those people are in for never and always, but to begin with, it's a, it's a second chance book. So like, there's just a lot of backstory that has to get there. Also, just because of who they are and what their relationship is, yeah, it's not as expansive because they're the inside of Hannah's head is just twenty four seven Levi, and the inside of Levi's head is just twenty four seven Hannah. Yep. With anyone where you've known them all your life, even if you're not in love with them, all of the things that have ever happened to you happened to them too. Oh yeah. So a lot of their conflict, um, other than about their breakup is that they have wildly different versions of their shared past. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you've known someone your whole life, you assume that they have the same version of things that you do because they were there for it. Mm -hmm. And so Levi's like, well, of course I did this because this happened. Hannah's like, that's not what happened at all. And Levi's like, you were literally in the room when it happened. It's like, what's, you know, how you don't communicate with someone you assume you shouldn't have to communicate with because you've always known them. In any kind of series, you want to question in the second book sort of the things that you set up in the first book. Yeah. So in the first book, Cass is sort of this perfect character who's like deeply beloved by all of the people around them. Her, um, even though Noelle is angry with her, like her, she's this matriarch and she's just died and everyone is grieving her. But Cass and Levi had a very contentious relationship and Levi does not have a good memory of Cass at all and so he's sort of bringing back the question of like was how you all remember Cass correct or is there more nuance to it so 
And then then there's the pressure of you're not supposed to speak ill or honestly of the dead. Yeah. And also, you know, everyone who we see at Kerrigan's came there, even though Miriam and Hannah grew up visiting there, they didn't grow up living there. Right. And Levi grew up there because his parents are the, the handyman and the chef. So he lived in the this hotel in the middle of nowhere in the woods. And he went to school in this tiny little town in the 90s as a queer kid. And so like his version of Kerrigan's and Advent, the town next to it, is much less sunny and beautiful and like it's a perfect utopia of Christmas feelings than everyone else's. Yeah, it's like the uh, trailers that cast Mary Poppins as a horror movie. Oh, yeah. God, yes. Have yeah. you have you seen those? And then a woman yeah. comes out of the sky. Yeah, like yeah. It, it recasts something that you think is very sparkly and good and pure. And it's like, wait, actually, no, this has got some problems. Oh, yeah. It's, it's also interesting to play with the heteronormative stereotypes of women where you are either this or this. You are either the benevolent mother who makes cookies. You are the benevolent grandmother who does no wrong. You are the evil ex. You are the heartless woman. Like, it's very narrow. That's the, the other thing about the shared language of, of Hallmark is that it is incredibly heteronormative and incredibly mm-hmm. gender essentialist and very limited in its, in its portrayal. And there's just replete with stereotypes. And it's nice to break those open and say, wait, well, what if it wasn't just, you know, garden variety evil because that's simple and kind of boring yeah and i think that's um i love i mean i don't think that you should ever sort of try to rewrite stereotypes or tropes until you love them right and i have watched a thousand hallmark movies and i love them um and i love obviously love romance novels um but like levi's the sort of you know he's going to come back and he's the prodigal son but he is demisexual and pansexual and he wears eyeliner all the time. And he like all of his yarmulkes are floral. Um, That's hot. And, That's yeah. a hot business right there. Keep yeah. going. Yep. Mm-hmm. He has one, that, a green velvet one that matches his green velvet suit. Like, oh, yeah. That's excellent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is like. um. Elliot from The Magicians meets Roy Kent. Like, he's like whiny, self obsessed, queer disaster with an anger problem. And he's not the sort of like romance hero, right? Because I just was like, I can't write that guy. Well, you already Um, wrote a lumberjack. You can't do it again. Right. I can't, I can't do like the stoic. But I wrote a lesbian lumberjack, right? Like the stoic, like guy who's like super judgmental of your life choices, which Noelle is able to be like pretty judgmental. Yeah. Oh, of right. Miriam. Miriam's face. She's like, where were you? Yeah. You left. So fuck off. Yeah. Keep going. If Keep fucking she off. If you were a cis straight man, that would be a power dynamic differential that would be very different than what oh, we yeah. have. Oh, yeah. Right. And so I felt comfortable writing into that for Noel in a way that I would not have felt comfortable for a, for a male character. Um, and, you know, for, to do a queer male female book for my second book, I was like, I don't feel comfortable with this sort of like alpha dude who's especially the really angry one. You know, he needs to, he's a really angry character and he needed to have some like, really outside of the box of the trope stuff. So I think that's part of my writing, whatever is to kind of find the trope that I love Mm -hmm. and go like, what happens if we turn this on its head? Yeah. Cause I've seen angry dudes. I've seen plenty. Don't, I don't need more. No, I'm not a big fan of the romance hero. Who's like, I have had a feeling and it is your fault and I don't like it. (laughs) So I'm going to be mad at you and I'm going to treat you poorly because I have had a feeling and I don't like it and it's your fault. So I'm going to yell at you about it. Like my guy, emotional security and emotional maturity are super freaking hot. Catch up. Levi thinks all of his feelings are his fault and also all of everyone else's feelings are also his fault. And he feels very bad about it. Yeah. Yeah. Which also very relatable can confirm have had that thought too. 
I mean, I love him. I love what you've done with him. I think it, like, I think he works great. Yay. We're going to see if the world is ready for a pansexual eyeliner man in too many scarves. I mean, I think so. I think so. What books are you reading that you want to tell people about? Sam and I were texting, like, what's, do you have a list? Because we both just forget when someone asks us. I have a long list. I made a list. I specifically <clears throat> checked out my, like, iPad because I was like, I'm going to forget. Oh, yeah. Some people always, see, people ask me for book recommendations. And I'm always like, wait, what's a book? You can't ask me that question without, like, me having some writing implements nearby. It's just, whoosh, my brain goes, bye-bye. I immediately me too, and I'm a librarian. Yeah, I know this. I know this problem. Let's see. So if you like, you've got male retellings, which I think there are not enough of in the world. Um, and you like fantasy. I am personally obsessed with Megan Bannon's The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. Quite possibly one of my favorite books of this year. God, so I cried <laughs> hysterically. Um. One I of, loved that book. It was it's, a stunner. It's so good. I was like, how did she do this from a craft perspective? How? I know. I was like, I was I, mad at how good it was. <laughs> <laughs> I like was like, this is just the best thing I've read, I think, this year. Like, I want everyone to read it. I love books that deal honestly with death. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. be real about what death is. And it that was very, very honest about, like, the repercussions of dying. And, and yeah, that book was, oh, my gosh, it was so good. This is a, a sadder death book, but Helena and I both read Sean McGuire's October Day series, which I cannot recommend highly enough. And uh, Be the Serpent is the latest book in that series, and it is guaranteed to kill you, literally. And I cannot stop thinking about it. And it has been months since I read it. It is like book 16 in a series. So you do have to read the other ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like you can't start. You can't start the in death series in the middle. You're going to also look for content notes for every single book. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So, Helena, do you have any books that you want to mention to people? Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time during the pandemic. I'm not that we're out of the pandemic. We're obviously not. But um, reading only historical mystery romance series. With Ooh, Lucky me Detective. too. Tell me all your wrecks. So I have a million, but the couple that I'm really into right now, um, Kate Belly's series. The first one is Deception by Gaslight. That's the third one just came out. It's a new series. It's really good. Um, and it's really good. I'm seconding that. I love that series. So good. Uh, both of these series that I'm going to wreck right now are are um, Gilded Age, New York. Um, just happens to be. Um, and then the other series that I like a lot that's um, is Counterfeit Lady by Victoria Thompson. Yep. That's those are not murder mysteries. They're cons. The main character is a con artist who's like fallen in love with someone who's um proper so she's reformed but she runs cons just like to help people so it's like like gilded age leverage i will only read historical mysteries if there's like a couple that's gonna end up together there's gonna be smooching like i'm very specific parameters and i also have three like ironclad rules that will make me quit a series um no like aggressive fat phobia which kicks out a lot of series it of really historical does. mysteries really fast. No super weirdness about the Romany, which what is like, with that? Why does all the time? What the hell? And then we went to the room of fortune teller. No, no, no. If anyone goes near a Romany person, I'm like, no. Out. And we are out. Um, it's like that chapter is- of the Grand Sophie by Georgette Hare, yeah. where she just goes to a Jewish moneylender because yeah. Georgette Hare was yeah. a raging anti-Semite yeah. and there's no other yeah, reason. Yeah. It's like, why are we You're doing this? Like, why do what? We- yeah. What? Unless the author like has a Roma background or a traveler background. Right. Uh, I think it's best if we just Let's acknowledge not. that they were there and don't try to write about it. Yeah. Um, Especially if we're going to use some ethnic slurs to do it. It would be great if we didn't fetishize just as a rule. 
It's a rule. Yeah. What? The third one is that <laughs> Sam's nobody, like, I'm sorry on behalf of publishing. I got to say, what? <laughs> nobody can have been driven mad by their homosexuality to become a serial killer. The number oh, of wow. historical mystery series that I've quit because the murderer was a gay person who was driven mad by their homosexuality to become no. a serial killer. So no is murdery like, queers. Well, I mean, they, qu- be, they, they could be murdery, be murdery and queer, but they can't be murdery because of the queer. Right. Yeah, gotcha. because they're queer. Right. I mean, I'm all fine for murder. Yes. Okay. So those are like my three hard passes. And it turns out that that kicks out a lot of series. It really does. Mystery romances. The book that I can't stop talking about this year, and I talk about all the time, is Bet on It by Jody Slaughter. It's so good. I think Jody Slaughter can do no wrong. I love everything Jody Slaughter writes. I love Jody Slaughter as a human. It's billed as like these two people have a bingo based sex pact and they do have a bingo based sex pact, but it's also has this incredible anxiety rep. Um, I'm an adult child of alcoholics. It has the best adult child of alcoholics rep I've seen maybe ever. I sobbed and I texted Jody and was like, why am I crying so hard for your book? It's really sexy. Jody Slaughter always has a hot car sex scene. So like, um, there's hot car sex. Uh, there's great fat rep. Uh, he takes care of her when she's on her period. Oh, when? I love that. Right. It's really good. Um, and I think it just flew too much under the radar for my personal <laughs> preference this year. I wish everyone was yelling about it. Um, and the two that I haven't gotten to this yet that are like my to buy, no matter what, auto buy forever authors, they're on my TBR is Therese Bahari's new book, um, Ghost in Shining Armor, and Jackie Lau's new book, The Stand-Up Groomsman. I have two recommendations for you. Have you read Hither Page? Yes, and the sequel. Oh, it's, so good. oh good, right? I've reread it. It's like one of my comfort reads. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why am I yes. reading this book about this doctor and this other guy and they're constantly out in the cold? This is not cozy. Their feet are wet. Their feet are wet all the time. Yet, I keep going and reading it again because I love it so much. The other book I want to suggest is a um, historical heist with magic set in 1920s Black Washington, D.C., Okay, the look you just okay. made. Go on. It's called the. I was like, I think I know what book this is. But it's I'm called really the Monsters it. We Defy by Leslie <gasps> Penelope. Okay, yes, it's so good. It is so good, and it's got all of that mixture of historical but historical specificity plus magic and magical world building on top of this wonderful specific, um, like anchored world. It's so good. I also will plug her fantasy romances, oh, yeah. which I can't remember the names of right now, but they're something, fun. something blood and it, a, a something of blood and something, a song of blood. Uh, yeah. I, a song, it's, I think it's a song. It's a song of blood and stone. A song of blood and stone. You win. Yay! Wow. I never remember anything these days. Well done. Excellent work. Yeah. Well done. I love historical mysteries, too. I was thinking earlier that I think the reason that I've been gravitating towards mystery with romantic elements is that everything is so disordered and chaotic in the world. And there's so much harmful disorder that reading about the restoration of justice and order and fairness and and making sure that people are looking after each other appropriately in the in that context is very, very soothing. I completely agree very much. I am really interested in like ex- immediately post world war one and immediately post world war two books, mm-hmm. especially if the person was a spy. Um, so like the Verity Kent series where sh- she was a spy and in world war one and her husband was presumed dead and he comes back and they have to like put their world back together and put their marriage back together. And they keep getting sucked into old stuff. Verity Kent. It's by Anna Lee Huber. Yes. H-E-U-B-E-R. She has two series. The other one is like Lady Darby. 1600s or something. No, Lady Darby is, oh God, I want to say Regency or thereabouts. But the current Lady Darby books that are coming out right now are set during the cholera epidemic. Mm, Yeah. So she's (laughs) writing about a pandemic of cholera. And that they... And they and they and they they don't know like why it's happening and they don't know why it's spreading. And I'm like, oh, yeah, ooh, this is giving me the chills. 
It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, yes. Um, both of those series are great. Uh, the Verity Kent one, there's something about the fact that these two people who are working so hard to put their world back together with like really bad PTSD, which they don't really know anything about because yep. it's the 1920s in Britain. Yep. And that they don't know that there's another war about to happen. Yeah. But it's we like, do. You, yeah, you can sort of see it coming. There's something about that that I am like really drawn to. Oh, yeah. You might yeah. also like it's contemporary, but there's also historical element. You might also like um, Deanna Rayborn's Killers of a Certain Age. It's about assassins and they are on their their women assassins. There's four of them and they are on their retirement cruise from the museum, which is the extra governmental agency that they started working at after World War Two. And their job was to kill Nazis. And then it got bigger. Um, they're on their retirement cruise and they spot someone that they know is an operative and they realize that the cruise is a setup to kill them. And so they have to hide, get away, figure out who's trying to kill them and outwit them without any of the resources of the agency for which they work. Mm -hmm. So they have to use all of their abilities, but it relies very heavily on very quiet, determined female rage and the fact that people always underestimate older women and they have Mm -hmm. to use incredibly creative ways of being lethal. It is so much fun. Well, where can people find you if you wish to be found? I know I was going to say, by the time this comes out, will there be a Twitter? I have no idea. (laughs) But at all places, I'm Sam J. Brody. (laughs) J is in June. And B-R-O-D-Y. Got it. I am uh, Bloom Again Curios. B-L-U-M Again Curios. Bloom is Miriam's last name. Bloom Again Curios is her shop where she remakes unwanted antiques into very bizarre pieces of glitter covered art. Bloom Again Curios, B L U M Again Curios is on my Twitter and my Instagram handle. And you can go to HelenaGreer.com and sign up for my newsletter where approximately once a month I send out news about what's happening at Kerrigan's right now. Yay! Awesome! You got a whole fictional world to play around in. I do have a whole fictional world to play around. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview. And thank you most of all for this book. I absolutely loved it. And it was so exciting to talk to you about it. So thank you so, so much for this. It was a literal dream come true. Oh, thank you. When I got asked like what I wanted to do to publicize the book, I was like, can I go on the Smart Bitches podcast, please? (laughs) I asked for you and Glennon Doyle. Whoa. I didn't get Glennon, but that's okay. You sure. should. I'll, I'll, I don't know her, but I'll just be like, Glennon, <laughs> forever. Thank you so, so much. And thank you for the compliments. That completely makes my day. I'm honored to have had a small part in having this book come into the world. And thank you both for bringing this book into the world. It's really, really wonderful. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much to Sam and Helena for connecting with me and for all of the things they talked about in this interview. I had such a good time. I will have links to all of the books that we talked about. But after we finished recording, Sam actually emailed me with two other titles that she wanted me to mention for her. She felt bad that she hadn't mentioned them. Lizette Deco's Anna Takes Manhattan is, quote, my coworker Sabrina Fleming's first acquisition it's so exciting and is an absolutely hilarious cannot put down story about a television producer who's known for creating perfect marriage proposals but her life is anything but the author and Anna are Cuban American and she's pulled inspiration for her life as a reality TV producer for shows like Say Yes to the Dress and 90 Day Fiance that's so cool the other book that uh, Sam asked me to mention was Felicia Grossman who is joining forever with Marry Me by Midnight a Cinderella Regency retelling set in London's Jewish community where a charming heiress must marry to save her family business, but the one man she dreams of most is the one she can't have. It's sweet and swoony and sexy and basically all the feels of ever after in book form, says Sam. Thank you, Sam. I will have links to all of those books, of course, in the show notes, never fear. And as always, I end each episode with a dreadful joke. And this week's joke, no one has heard it, not even the people in the Patreon, is from Helena, specifically Helena's child. This is a joke from Helena's child. I'm so excited about this. What the... (laughs) I'm so excited. I can't even talk. Let's try that again. What did the doctor say to her marshmallow patient? Give up. What did the doctor say to her marshmallow patient? I think you have a s'more throat. (laughs) 
That's so cute. I love it so much. <laughs> Thank you, Helena, for sharing this joke. I love it. I love it. I love it. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of reading. Have a wonderful weekend and we will see you back here next week. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcast. Smore throat. <laughs>